So my name is Rick Heil. I'm a biologist in the Melbourne Fisheries Lab over on the Upper St. Johns River. Um, I've been working with American Shad since I was in school back in the early 2000s up in Virginia. Uh, before I was in school studying shad, I used to fish for shad on the Nautilus. So it's kind of interesting to be able to get out of school and be working with them in a completely different place. Um, this talk is going to be kind of broad. I'm going to talk a little bit about the biology of American shad in general. Um, then a little bit of fishery history because they were once a really important fishery commercially and then recreationally. Um, quick overview of what FWC is doing to monitor and manage uh, the St. John's River population of American shad. And then a little bit of information on fishing for American shad. Primarily um, how the river changes with water levels and places to go uh, as far as tactics to fish for shad. If, if you get to see the talk by Mark Benson when he comes in, or if you ever get to talk to him, he knows better how to catch them than I do. So I probably don't need to talk too much about fishing for shad. Um, real quick start, just on my picture here, the top fish is an American shad. The bottom fish is actually a small cousin to the American shad, the blueback herring. Um, I'm not going to talk about the other Alosa species that are in Florida today. I'm just going to focus on American shad, but there are three Alosa species that are really closely related in the St. John's River. There's the American Shad, the Hickory Shad, and the Blueback Herring. Um, but the American Shad's the most fun to catch and the most common. So first we've got life history. Um, a little bit about the reproduction. Shad spend the majority of their life in the ocean, kind of like salmon. Um, the sub-adults and the adults live in the ocean. Um, and they range from Florida to Newfoundland, but they all mix, all those stocks that come out of those rivers as juveniles mix together in the Atlantic Ocean <clears throat> before it's time for them to spawn. Uh, they actually return to their natal river to spawn. Um, this has been determined by marking juveniles with chemicals, uh, you know, and releasing them back into the river, and, you know, they go out at sea disappear, and then when they come back to spawn, you can scan their otolith, which is the hard part in their head, to see if they have that mark. And river fish that are released in one river don't tend to show up in the other rivers. Um, and in rivers where the shad repeat spawn, where they can spawn and go back out to the ocean and then come back, they tend to always go back to the same river time after time. So they actually, even though they all go to the far north Atlantic, they go back to their to where they're at. They, they, the juveniles spend their first growing season um, in fresh water, and they leave typically in the fall as soon as the water starts to cool down. So the interesting thing is they only live in fresh water up north for a couple of months, and then down here they stay in fresh water until November or December until they get that cue to go out in the Atlantic, and then they all join together. Um, so they mature at age three to seven, um, which is kind of interesting in itself because that's a pretty big range of ages. We we actually see fish here in the St. Johns River from age three to seven. Those 20-inch fish that are pushing five pounds are usually between five and seven years old, but they're virgin fish. They spent all that time in the ocean deferring the opportunity to spawn until they come back in. Um, and up north, where they actually can repeat spawn, they've recorded fish over 10 years old and over 9 or 10 pounds. We actually caught a, a male American shad in the gillnet in Virginia once it was 9 pounds. And that fish was, that fish was 8 or 9 years old. Um, so the females average 2 to 4 pounds as virgin fish, which is what we see down here. And then in the southern river, basically every river south of Cape Hatteras, there's a, there, pretty much all die after they spawn. There's a little bit of repeat spawning in the Noose River, which comes out into the, the lower Pamlico Sound, and maybe in the Cape Fear River, but every river south of that, no repeat spawning has ever been documented. Um, I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, it's, it is environmental, um, but they could you know, choose to leave before it got too hot if they wanted to. But, uh, 
So what, a lot of what we know about the migration and the fact that they mix in the upper ocean from a tagging study that um, was done back in the late 70s and early 80s. Over the course of five years, some research tagging fish up here in the Bay of Fundy in the summertime, and they were basically catching these fish out of these huge pound nets where the tides go up and down 20 feet. They have these pound nets, you know, and the, the tide comes in, the tide goes back out, and they drive their four-wheelers or their jeeps or whatever out to the head of that pound net and take the fish out. And so they were actually tagging shad out of those pound nets, and they were tagging little shad, big shad, you know, sub-adult, mature fish. And all of these little circles are the tag returns they got from subsequent spawns. And we, we ended up getting, or they ended up getting 25 tag returns just from the St. John's River, which is one of them which is more than most any other river other than the uh, the Connecticut River or the the Connecticut River and the Delaware River which probably have the strongest populations on the coast so it makes sense they'd get the most most tag returns but what that ended up showing was that basically every river on the east coast their juveniles in what the pro production from those rivers contributes to what's being collected up here in the Bay of Fundy so, what this looks like is in the summer and fall, the yellowfish, the, the immature sub adult fish, or the yellow cliff arcs, um, the fish tend to be on the continental shelf or up in the Bay of Fundy or up there in the bay around Newfoundland. I'll just. And then in the fall, about this time of year, they start making their way south. And the fish that are going to spawn in the Chesapeake Bay and Delaware River and, and Hudson River, they tend to go hang out, you know, down there in the mid-Atlantic. Those fish that spawn in those Canadian rivers, most of those stay up there on the shelf off of Nova Scotia. But they partition themselves out and they go hang out in the ocean, kind of in the vicinity of wherever their home river is. So then in the winter and spring, this is about how they're distributed, and most of this has been determined from uh, Florida's off the map. Um, this has been determined from trawl surveys off the coast, fisheries encountering them. This is just where people tend to run into them in the ocean. But starting in November and December, which unfortunately that one's off the screen, but they go up the St. John's River, and the ones that go up the St. John's River die after they spawn, although they get to stick around the river for quite a few months before they finally give it, give up. Some fish go up the Savannah River and the sub-adults head back up north and so on. And as the season progresses, you know, the fish, you know, you get into March and April, the fish are going into the Chesapeake Bay, the sub-adults are still heading north. And those fish that spawn in the mid-Atlantic, they go up their river and then to wherever they're going to spend the summer once they're done spawning. And then once they're done spawning, we're back to that distribution where they're all clumped up there in eastern Canada. So do southern shad really die after spawning? I had a long conversation last year with Mark at the program. He cornered me one day when we were done sampling um, because he, he didn't want to believe it. And it's a hard thing to believe because you don't see a lot of American shad piled up dead on the river. You think, gee, if there's 50,000 fish in here, die, why don't we see more? But, well, that's the thing is the, the run, the one thing, the run is staggered. The fish don't all come in at once. You know, when you fish for them, you'll find out some come in in early January, then mid-January, then February, and they actually live in the river for two months before they die, so they, they just gradually die off. And if you're out there a lot in April and May, when it's getting really hot and the spawn's running down, You'll see them kind of listless on the top of the water. Little, they're just skin and bone. And the hardest evidence we have that there's no repeat spawning is in the southern rivers, they don't have spawning marks on their scales. Where they repeat spawn, when they come into fresh water, they resorb part of their scale. Because even, even where they repeat spawn, that, that migration and spawning event in fresh water is stressful to them. They use a lot of their energy reserves. So that leaves a mark on the scale, and you don't see that on southern fish. And then some researchers in the early 80s actually looked at the energy composition of the fish 
pre-spawn and post-spawn and found that the southern fish were using 70 or 80 percent of their energy reserves by the end of the spawning season. And that's just 70 percent is kind of the point of no return. That's the case in salmonids. The ones that use less than 70 percent are repeat spawners that can go up and down the rivers like the old coastal brook trout populations up in the northeast. But once you pass that 70 percent barrier of your energy reserves, you just don't have enough energy to make it back out to the ocean and survive. Um, and then finally, adults that have been tagged in the southern rivers, like when you're doing a population study and you tag 2,000 fish that are running up the river because you want to see how many of those fish are getting captured in the fishery, well, they don't all get captured, and if they repeat spawn, they're going to go back out in the ocean and come back next year. You'll get some of those. The southern fish that have been tagged within the river on their spawning run don't get captured outside the river after that year or back in that river in subsequent years. So, and this is an illustration of the amount of weight loss that they undergo in the St. John River. Um, it's just a, it's just the average body weight in a given of what we see in a given sample indexed against the length of the fish. So basically, we, you know, accounting for length. Um, as the season goes on, you can see the fish get skinnier and skinnier. Um, and, you know, early in the year, the fish are one and a half times what the average fish over the whole year is as far as the fatness factor. And this is accounting for eggs. Um, we had, this is actually with the eggs removed, so this is the actual body mass of the fish. So it's not just that they're getting light because they, they dumped that load of eggs. This is the actual amount of body mass they lose in the St. John's River. So by the end of the season, a fish of a given length weighs half as much as it would at the beginning of the season. So on the left, you see the big fat fish from the entry, from the entry photo. And down on the bottom right, that's a fish of approximately They're both about 16-inch fish. And that fish on the bottom right is basically skin and bone. And the fish on that top left probably weighed two and a half, three pounds, and the one down there on the bottom right probably weighs one, 1. 1.2. Just no energy to make it back out. What would be the weight of the average at the one level? The one level, this is corrected for length, because obviously a longer fish is going to be heavier. So um, that's just for, for any given length. This, this is the index okay. after length has been accounted for. That's, um, so basically what it says is a fish that's 20 inches, a fish that's 20 inches and up there at the 1.5 level weighs 4 pounds. A fish that's 20 inches and over there at 0.8 weighs 2 pounds. So that's, that's how that works. And so or a 15 inch fish weighs 2.5 on the left end and weighs that's body fat. That's, that's, they use their subcutaneous fat first, then they start dipping into their, into their white muscle fiber, because um, there are actually, people have actually tracked this along the migration, you know, taking biopsies of the fish at different points along the migration route. And they actually can convert body mass into eggs, because they actually continue to make eggs once they're on the spawning ground. That's why they're here for two months, they're actually spawning the entire time they're in the river. They just keep making more and more eggs. And that's why it's so energetically demanding. Um, this was a graph uh, of some telemetry data that UF did. They were working with the water management district looking at flows and levels, so they wanted to know where the fish went um, at different water levels, what the key habitats were. But I have this in here to illustrate the length of time that the fish are in the river spawning. Um, on the top left, you see they tag the fish around February 1st. They actually track that fish within the river until the beginning of May. So that's a pretty long time for that fish to reside in the river. And over the course of three years, they tagged almost 200 fish, and none of them were ever detected exiting the river. They put hydrophones downstream to listen for them, and all the fish that went up stayed up. But you can see, once they're on the spawning ground, they, they stay up there. Um, so specific to the St. John's River, our spawning season, I've already kind of mentioned, is starts in December, runs into early May. The peak of activity is from mid-January to early March. Um, 
Some years we'll get a pretty good early push of fish, and there'll be a lot of fish around in early January. But the biggest numbers of fish we ever see is pretty much beginning of February, and then just a little bit either side of that. On the grounds right now run from Lake Monroe to Lake Poinsett. Um, there are a few fish when the water's high enough. They'll run all the way to the weir at Lake Washington and use the river up there, but they tend they tend to like the sandier parts of the river where there's a little more gradient, um, especially between Lake Harney and Lake Poinsett. Um, but it really depends on water level what they have access to. Um, they also utilize the St. John or the Econ Lockhatchee River. Um, that's got pretty good flow sometimes, um, and when the flow is good enough in there relative to the St. Johns, it'll attract some fish up there. So on to the fisheries, um, the total coastwide harvest of American shad, and this is back in the old days from the, eight, from the seven, they started fishing them basically before we were a country because it was a protein source that just came up the river. Washington had a Hall Sane site right behind Mount Vernon on the Potomac River. Um, and the fishing got more and more intense until right around the turn of the century, uh, the harvest reached 50 million pounds in a year. Um, and that's in aggregate. That was, you know, the, all the rivers combined. Um, but that's still, that's an impressive amount of fish. And back then, it, all the fishing occurred within the rivers. They fished the fish as they were coming in. They used haul seines, pound nets, gill nets. Um, when the stocks really started to decline in the 70s and 80s, the states started locking down regulations within their rivers, and the fishery moved to the ocean. So when we got into the 90s, people were trying to preserve their stocks in the rivers, but then they were getting fished in the ocean. If you remember from the earlier slide, the fish, the shad populations, they all mixed together in the ocean. So if you're fishing in the ocean, you're fishing on fish from somebody else's state. So that's what was going on in the, in the 80s and 90s. And then the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission said you can't be fishing on mixed stocks like that because then we can't manage the depressed rivers. So they closed the ocean fisheries down in 2005. Um, and this is just some illustration of the gears. Uh, this is a gill net on the James River, which is where I did a lot of my work when I was, when I was in school. Um, the fishery is under moratorium there, but the gill nets are actually, there's one gill net fished on the river that's a, an index because the catch rate in that net is indexed against what the fishery used to catch to see if the population is going up or down. And so that's, but that's the gear. When I was growing up in the early 80s, that part of the river was, was just wall-to-wall -wall gill nets. It was amazing to see it because those gill nets actually hang from poles. And so you drive across that bridge and it was just a sea of poles. It was amazing the amount of fishing effort that was going in for them. And that's a pound net that was on the James River way back in the day. Um, that was one of the primary gears on the St. John's River, too, back in the, uh, up until about the 50s. And that's just a, you got a big long fence and net that runs, runs into shallow water with a holding pen out in deep water and it just corrals the fish down into that holding pen. So, Graph of coastwide landing starting in 1950. Even in 50, it was still 10, 10 million pounds a year. But by the time we got into the 2000s, it was under 500,000 pounds harvested, and that was the entire coast. And that was because so many states were going into moratorium. So the population was getting into pretty bad shape as we got into the 2000s. Um, causes of decline, overfishing. Uh, simply weren't letting enough fish get to the spawning grounds to drop their eggs. You know, classic anadromous fish problem is the spawning runs getting obstructed by dams. Fish just can't get to the spawning ground. Same thing has happened with the salmon on the west coast, which the irony there is the structures they've put in on the west coast, especially on the Columbia River, past the salmon upstream, aren't doing much for salmon. Shad love them. And the biggest shad population in the world right now is on the Columbia River <laughs> in Washington State because the shad can actually use the hoppers to go upstream and then the juvenile shad love the reservoirs as habitat and the juvenile salmon hate the reservoirs as habitat so they've created a shad factory out there which we have not been able to duplicate that fish passage success on the east coast um, major problem and this is one that's still facing a lot of rivers is water quality um, there's all the oxygen depletion almost almost wiped out the shad population in the delaware river 
That's one of the few rivers on the East Coast, major runs, didn't get blocked by a dam. Uh, but the amount of pollution coming out of Philadelphia was creating an oxygen sag right at the head of Delaware Bay. And so the, the adult shad could get up the river in the springtime and spawn, but then the juvenile shad couldn't get out in the fall when, when, the, when that oxygen was dropping down. And if you have algae blooms in your river, and then that algae goes downstream and dies close to the river mouth, that can create an oxygen problem too. And of course, withdrawals, if you have major withdrawals, you can suck the fish right out of the river. That's a, that's a big problem actually on the Hudson River where they, had, they have once, once through cooling on a lot of their power plants instead of cooling towers. And so they just, when the river's low, the entire volume of the river gets pulled through the power plants. And so uh, that's an issue with that. And if you pull out too much water, there's no, no water to spawn. Uh, so in Florida, the commercial fishery was closed effectively by the gear restrictions, um, the, the requirements to keep entanglement gears outside of state waters. Basically shut down fishing in Florida. Plus, shad have a special regulation written for them. They can only be taken by hook and line only. So even if, even if there were entanglement gears or pound nets or, or commercial cast nets on the St. John's River, they can't harvest shad. Um, so that, that 10 per day limit goes to all gears because you can only take, take fish, take shad. Um, and I mentioned earlier that ocean intercept fishery that was operating in the mid-Atlantic and upper southern states has closed down and hopefully that's given, given our shad a bit of a break. Um, as far as the recreational fishery, it's, it's down from what it used to be. Um, Florida commercial landings were pretty darn impressive. 1908, it was over two and a half million pounds of shad harvested out of the St. John's River. Um, that was principally by gill nets that were operating in Jacksonville. And at that time, the guys that were haul seining for shad in the Wallaca area in Palatka were complaining that the fishing was so intense at the mouth of the river that there was nothing making it through for them to catch in their fisheries. Um, and then the, the, the markets changed, the fishing locations changed, and that, that amount of fishing effort kind of backed down. Into the 50s, you can see there was over 500,000 pounds of fish harvested in, in the better years, um, which the, ex, the studies on the exploitation rate back then said that that was probably about 20 or 30 percent of the run that was being harvested, and that was 500. Five to seven hundred thousand pounds, and they estimated that with tagging studies. Um, may or may not have overestimated the population size. They they estimated a population of about two million pounds of fish in the coming up the river in the fifties, which would have numbered around seven hundred, eight hundred thousand fish. Pretty substantial run. Um, and it was right about the forties when people started to hook and line fish for them, and they were just kind of getting discovered. So. Those are a couple of Florida wildlife uh, cover sheets from articles about shad fishing. Um, the one on the left was actually from 1949, and that was a real rah-rah, let's get everybody to come to Florida and fish article talking about how great the shad fishing was. And, you know, come down here and enjoy the sunshine and catch a shad. Um, and then the later article was more of the same, really promoting the fishery, and that was m more towards the late 50s. And that's about when the recreational fishery for American shad in the St. John's River really peaked. Um, in 1958, they ran a really intense creel survey. They basically had guys on the river every day, counting fishermen, counting their catch. They had the fishermen turning in census cards at, the, at the, uh, all the fish camps that were operating up and down the river. There were like a dozen fish camps at the time. And they estimated that in that one year, there were 13,000 individual trips directed at American Shad and actually harvested 65,000 fish in the recreational fishery, um, which is pretty substantial. That's actually comparable fishing effort to, say, that same stretch of river when the crappie fishing's really good, like it was back in 2012, when you go there and the boat ramps are completely full every day, even on weekdays. Um, now, this year, uh, we ran a creel survey of our own. Uh, interviewing anglers at those access points, and it's down to a 
total of 1,750 trips over the course of 12 weeks, which if you spread that out over three boat ramps, that's, you know, 10, 15 guys a day at, at each boat ramp on average. And the catch was 11,000 fish, but most people are releasing their fish. And that's an estimated 11,000 fish because, you know, we're not, we don't get to count them all. We're, we're estimating that from the reports that come in. So the management of shad, um, they're managed through the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission because they cross state lines. Um, all the Atlantic states co-manage stocks under a fishery management plan, but each state has to write its own plan. And right now we're operating under a plan that was adopted in 2011. Um, and there's also a habitat plan that ours has been submitted and is under review um, to look at habitat issues in the river. And for us, that's primarily uh, water withdrawals and water quality and how those are going to end up affecting the shad and what can be done about them. Which actually the district did a lot of work on that with their water supply impact study. So our monitoring that's mandated under that plan is we electrofish for the adults so we can get a, we can get our own independent count of the size of the run. We have an access point angler survey where we go to the three major boat ramps and interview the anglers. Um, how long were their trip? How many fish did they catch on the trip? So we can actually calculate out an estimate of effort in the fishery, total catch. And uh, catch rate is actually kind of important because some anglers are better than other anglers. Some guys always do better. But if you average it out over the entire, all the fishermen that you interview, the catch rate is often, and that's the number of fish per unit of effort fishing. That's a pretty good index of how good the population of fish is when you average everybody out. You get a, you get a pretty big error bars on that estimate because some fish are so much better. Than hmm? Yeah, well that's the thing. There's all kinds of error introduced in that from people that don't tell you the truth. Um, the shad people are pretty enthusiastic about the shad and they actually, there's a couple guys that go out there with little counters on their belts because they get they get the competition who can catch the most in a day when the fish is good. And you know you get a good count from those guys. And since they're releasing all their fish anyway, you're just relying on their memory. They're not trying to hide them under the floorboards and sneak them through like some guy that's got 10 bass in his boat and says, I didn't catch any bass today. That happened last year pretty much. Um, and we have a juvenile survey because we want to know whether or not they're spawning successfully. We count the fish that get up the river, but then the conditions have to be good on the spawning ground. And, you know, if you pull too much water out or something else is happening on the spawning ground that degrades the habitat and prevents spawning success, we need to be able to document that so we can do something about it. So we monitor um, the juvenile production. So the electrofishing survey, we go out, we have areas of river that are representative of the whole spawning ground. The whole spawning ground is 200 kilometers long, so we can't sample the entire thing. So we have some representative areas that we sample. And we go out and sample in discrete amounts of time and count the number of fish that we catch per amount of time. Does that kill the fish or stun them? It just stuns them. We put them in that big giant live well. We actually put an oval live well in the boat so the fish can swim around us because shad don't sit still like a bass. And if you put them in a square tank, they beat themselves to death. So we put them in a, live, in a, in a round live well. It's aerated. And we measure them all. Um, you can actually determine their sex externally when they're on the spawning grounds. It's actually pretty easy to do. Um, and throw most of them back. Uh, we do keep a small subsample of the catch because we need to know how old they are. But actually, this is just an example of the data that we're getting from that. This is the average catch per electrofishing sample since we started the survey back in 2003. And, uh, actually, it's kind of looking, it's kind of looking favorable with the, with all the restrictions that have been put in place. The population was really depressed. Uh, the runs have been better in the last four or five years than they were, especially in that 2005 to 2008 period. I mean, the fishing wasn't even very good for them back then, but we've had some decent runs these last couple of years where the anglers have been going, yeah, it's been better this year than it has since 2000. 
Apparently there was a good run in 2000, but I wasn't here for that. So for aging, we do subsample some of the fish. We have to pull pull their ear bone out, pull out their otolith. Um, so the fish that are aged get sacrificed, which that allows us to look at other things. We can look at the size of the gonads, the condition of the gonads. We can pull their stomachs and look at those. And we're actually able to just look at them under naked light. And you see how it's got rings on it. Some of them don't have such good rings, and we just kind of go, well, I can't tell how old this fish is. But about 70% of them, you can count the rings, know how old the fish is. And the otoliths are really tiny. You can see it's that scale bar, 500 microns. An otolith, even though out of a five-pound shad, the otolith is about the size of a grain of sand. It's pretty small. What about the scales? I thought you could get those. You know, they used to age them by scales, but studies recently have found scales to be unreliable. Um, I, it's probably worth revisiting because they said, well, gee, scales are unreliable. These otoliths, these otoliths are, you know, this, this is, they work better. Because um, they went and did blind testing. They took a whole bunch of scales from a bunch of different rivers, got together in a lab, and had all the expert readers from the different labs up and down, and everybody got different ages. So, and, and so they weren't getting good age estimates. But part of that may be the fact that those northern fish that live for nine or ten years, what was happening was they were overestimating the age of the young fish and underestimating the age of the old fish. But that may not be such a problem for our southern fish because they don't live long enough. What happens when a fish, when a shad scales, you pick them up, the scales just come off. That old fish is going to have shed scales. It's going to have rings laid on top of rings. The spawning marks are going to erode back into the annuli from the previous year. So scales are unreliable. We might be able to use them in Florida. It's just right now we know this works, so it's kind of what we're sticking with. So that's a typical age structure for our population, um, for the females anyway. The females we see average, or they're age three to seven. Most of them are age four and five. Um, the males tend to be age three to five with very few six and seven year olds. So the males, at any given age, the males are smaller than females, and they tend to run at younger ages. So that's why the males are almost. Almost all the males you catch are smaller than females. Uh, juvenile survey, that's our push net. That's kind of a, it's basically a shrimp trawl, but we push it in front of the boat on the surface at night. Because um, the shad come to the surface at night, and if you pull a trawl behind the boat, they scatter. So we push it in front of the boat. Uh, we can calculate the volume of water that that fixed opening measures. So we get the number of fish per volume of water. And that gives us our index and we sample them from uh, pretty much Lake George to Blue Springs, and then there's a stretch of river from Wallaca all the way down below Palaka that we sample. So we have two areas. We have a river reach that we sample, and then down there in the tidal freshwater. So we try to move, because they don't always go to the same place every year, so we're trying to cover as much ground as we can. And I already described the angler survey. We use the three. It's... Uh, the major access points, Cameron White, C.S. Lee, and Mullet Lake, that's where 90% of the shad fishermen go. Um, I'll, I'll talk about some of the other places you can go, but if people start going to those places and fishing a whole lot, then I'm going to have to have a bigger creel survey, and that's going to cost more money. But, but I'm not discouraging anybody from going to those other boat ramps. It's just, it's, just e it's just easier if everybody goes to the same. It's easier to count you when everybody goes to the same place. Well, the push net you don't need because those are little, those are little tiny baby shads. But I can, I mean, I can show. I'm going to show you where where the where some concentrations are uh, of the adult fish. So, fishing for shad. Um, sometimes the shad menace the crappie anglers. The guys are out there on Lake Harney with their spider rigs. Shad comes and does five laps around the boat and they complain about the shad. <laughs> And then we, we catch we catch the shad in our electrofishing survey with the crappie jig stuck in their mouth because he broke him off. So that gives you an idea. You can use crappie jigs. So where to go on the St. John's River? 
It varies some from year to year, but not a whole lot from year to year. There's some spots that are pretty consistent. Basically, anywhere where you can find moving water and a hard bottom. Um, <laughs> I guess I'm going too slow. So, moving water and a harder bottom. Um, the best spots can change somewhat with water level uh, because they like moving water, but they like when they're not up moving around when they're holding, which is where you're going to find them most of the time when you're fishing. You're going to find where they're just kind of hanging out for the day. And when you locate those fish, they like to be they like to be as deep as they can be and still be in moving water. Um, so when the water is up, the fish can go into those bigger channel areas where it's deeper because there's there's water moving. But when the river gets really low and the flow gets low, those areas where you have the big wide river and the deep channel the current is super sluggish, and the shad are going to move move out of that area. Um, that's actually described pretty well. This is the book Jay was talking about earlier. It's called Wave Fly Fishing the Upper St. John's River Basin. And he said basin because he was looking at the tribs, and he explored the Econ, um, Econ Lakashi pretty extensively, um, mostly on foot, some in his Ginu with his electric motor. Um, and... Some of, a lot of the areas you got to walk into, I ran into him. I was on a hike with my girlfriend and her grandmother in a wildlife management area, and he was walking through the woods with his fly rod because it was a place he found where he could hike into the Econ Lakachi River. But there's some other areas that you can launch a you can car top, that, that sort of thing. So the major public accesses, um, you've got State Road 520. got the public boat ramp at State Road 520. Um, the fish don't always make it that far. Uh, it depends on if there's enough water for them to make it over all the shallow sandbars to get that far south. Uh, State Road 50, there are actually some really good shad concentrations at State Road 50. There are also a lot of airboat tours, so if you want to fish there, you got to go early in the morning or go north of the road during the week because most of the airboat tours go south. But if you go north in a kayak, you have to come back against the current. And most people like to go the other way around. Uh, there's a boat ramp at the end of Hatville Park Road. Long, long dirt road off of State Road 46. Some good shad fishing there. I'm not comfortable parking my car there sometimes. It's just, I don't know, it's, it's isolated. It's in the middle of nowhere. And it's a long dirt road, but there's some good habitat and it's pretty out there. And during the week, it can be really quiet. Um, and everything else is basically accessible off of State Road 46 as far as boat ramps. Except for Lemon Bluff, you got to come out off of 415 to get to that one. So these are some, and these actually, these, these aren't our electrofishing data. This is telemetry data. In 2010, the water was pretty high. It was an El Nino year. Can you un uh, just the resume play thing that's in the screen? Um, 2010 is on the left. That was a year when there was a lot of rain. It was an El Nino year. The water actually got pretty high in March. Um, the fish distributed themselves all the way from Lake Winder to Lake Monroe. Um, 2011 was a low water year, and it was a really low water year. We almost had to use the airboat to electrofish because we pretty much couldn't get the dock up there at 50. And basically, the fish stopped at the Tosahatchee power lines. If you ever go to the Tosahatchee Wildlife Management Area, there's a long dirt road that goes out to the river just upstream of that. There's a sandbar, and they just couldn't get across it because the water was so low. But you can see the concentrations, and in the given years, there's concentrations of fish just upstream of State Road 50. Um, the usual place where people fish is between Harney and the Econ Montana River. Um, people may not realize it. There's actually usually a pretty good concentration of fish between Lake Jessup and Lake Monroe. We see them electro fishing and a heck of a lot of fish that they put their sonic tags in use that stretch of river. Um, and the fishing can be really good down there. And usually the fishing's really good down there when there's a really strong south wind 
and Lake Jessup is discharging into the river. That creates a lot of current downstream from the lake, but there's also a lot of plankton coming out of the lake. And there's sandbars down below the lake, and the fish will move up on that sandbar. And that's a place where you can often go catch hybrid striped bass and American shad side by side on the same lures. Um, that's, that's an area to consider. It may not be as far of a drive to get to where you live. Um, I'm curious, we fish that port there in this pond in uh, St. John's? Yes. And there's a lot of people fishing there, so we thought it was a pretty good spot. Oh, well, that's if you see where I've got the arrow pointing at the C.S. Lee boat ramp, uh -huh. all those stars there, that's, that's generally okay. a good spot. Um, <coughs> One thing we saw last year was that spot was really hot um, in January and early February, and then the fish moved because the anglers quit catching them there, and then when we went through with the shock boat looking for them, they, were, they hadn't moved far. You can actually, if you go across Puzzle Lake, south of Puzzle Lake, like upstream, you see like right below where it says Puzzle Lake, there's like a little cluster of stars on both maps. There's some really good good fishing up there. It's just hard to get to because you got to get all the way across Puzzle Lake. Um, and then find your way back. And then find your way back. <laughs> you know, you can drop down to it from the Hatbill ramp, or you can go all the way up there from State Road 46. But either way, it's a it's a hike to get there. But I know it's it's good fishing. Um, the river right there actually has hard bottom and a lot of current. Even right where it enters Puzzle Lake, you can't really tell there's a river there. There's a little cut channel and some sand, and you can see the current making its way through there, and it holds fish. So this is just the river at State Road 50. Um, those are the. This is where the the river there is actually kind of big and deep. It's what I would consider a decent, moderate water level fishing spot. When Basically, if you leave the boat ramp and you go to those S-curves that are south of it, if you see the water moving through there and see some boils, it's pretty likely to be holding fish. But when the water gets low, like it did, this was going into 2011. This is December 2010, according to Google Earth, and I believe it because it was, it was low. The fish will move further up. This is just a, a couple miles further south. Um, of that area, and you can see the sandbanks are exposed. But it's these areas where you see the exposed sandbanks where you can go find the current when the river's low. And where the fish will tend to, tend to locate is, which is hard to see with the light. You'll find an area where there's a really good sandbar, nice clean sand, and one of fast over. Most of the time, especially in the uh, middle of the day, the fish won't be up on this sandbar, but there'll be a cut on the outside of the bend where the current's kind of working through, and the fish will be, they'll be close to that sandbar, because probably that sandbar is where, they're going, where they want to put their eggs the next night, but during the day, you know, when they're just hanging out waiting for time to spawn, they're going to be in that, that deeper water, close to that sandbar. So this is a map that the, one of the biologists of the Water Management District produced. Luke borrowed them and put them in his book. Um, and actually, in, if you go to either that website, I think they're still there. It's kind of old. Um, or if Luke's book is complete. He has different water levels and what areas are good. Basically, yellow is the water's really sluggish. Pale blue is the water's got good current, but it's too shallow. In dark blues, there's good current and good depth. And that tends to be where the best spawning habitat is, and that's where the best fishing tends to be. And so Luke included those in his books. And what you see is basically when the water level goes down, those dark blue areas shrink, and when the water goes up, they expand. Now, right now, the same time was probably been the highest that you, for the previous time, I don't remember it getting that high. It was very high. It got in, in the middle river. What I call the Middle River, I'd say everything below Lake Washington, it got it got pretty high. <laughs> it's it's actually interesting because it, it actually backed up 
from downstream because that rain was so heavy in Seminole and Volusia County and not so heavy in Brevard County. We had water in Brevard, but it wasn't as, as heavy as what's down there, and it's still draining out, which is probably actually good for shad to have high water that's falling back within banks when the spawning season starts, because then there's adequate water for them. Um, and actually, it may make the fishing better, which I'll get to that with this. Natural food. In the ocean, they eat krill, little eufalzid krill. They're 5, 10 millimeters long. So they eat plankton. They got these big, long gill rakers. They just ram the water through their mouths and then swallow what gets stuck on the gill rakers. Hmm? <laughs> no. <laughs> so they, uh, so little, little, little tiny stuff that looks like a shrimpy plankton is, is good. Not easy to work down there at, at State Road 46, Puzzle Lake when the southeast wind's blowing 15 miles an hour. Um, so for, they are eating? They, 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 they're at least attempting to eat. They, like to eat. they like to eat small, slow things. And so when they come into fresh water, 99% of the time there's nothing available for them to eat because the small, slow stuff that they would eat is up in the marsh somewhere. Or if they're in a river, you know, like the Roanoke River or the James River, one of those rivers up that flows off the Piedmont that's higher gradient. They flood and they go right back down. And then there's nothing in the river but minnows and stuff that's too big and too fast for them. So, but they are trying to eat. And that's the interesting thing. They spawn until they die, but they retain the ability to feed, which is, from a scientific standpoint, that's a neat curiosity. And that's interesting. I've heard they're attacking whatever you're throwing at them because as aggression. Well, that's the old. That's kind of the old saw: is they're attacking out of aggression. Um, but when you think about it, you know, a, a bass is defending a bed. You know, when you pitch something on that bass bed, that male bass is going to go get that, get that off the bed. So you don't want the brim or the Seminole killifish coming in there and eating his eggs. But these shad, they don't make beds. They don't defend the eggs. The female swims across the sandbar with a whole horde of males in pursuit, fertilizing. And she'll deposit, in a season, a female deposits six or 700,000 eggs. But in each event, she deposits 50,000 eggs. But just it's willy-nilly. And so if she was defending eggs or the male was, they'd be defending somebody else's eggs because the eggs are just out there in a given night. If, you ever watch, see, if you're ever up there, like below the econ, there's that really good sandbar. That's a good place to go see shad spawning activity when, when they're abundant in that area. Because right around sunset, they'll come up on that bar and it's... The fish are darting across the bar, and there's, you know, it's just a lot of activity. And so they're just spewing the eggs kind of all over the place. So they're not really, def it, it's like, ah, they're, you know, they want to chase these things away, but they're not, def if they were, they're not defending their own progeny. So more than likely, that's not the case. This is a side note. I went fishing with a guy by the name of Sway, and he gave me this lore that he had rigged. And it looked like that shrimp grill, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I have pure day. Yeah. Because of this little antenna kind of thing. And then I didn't have the next time out. And I mean, you know, maybe it was just the day, but I've tried several times and I never recreated that day. So. Well, it's, it's worth a shot. The vast majority of people that have fished for shad over the years use crappie jigs. Down on the bottom left, those are the classic shad darts. Um, that can be rigged in tandem or multiple. Sometimes you'll see the shad dart and they'll have the trailing spoon behind it. Um, and the, most people fish with that, but something that's little and imitates what they're really used to eating can't hurt. And I'll actually get the, we've, we've documented some feeding in, in the St. John's, which as many shad as I've looked at over the years, it was an event to find what we found. Because when I did my thesis work, in Virginia, I was doing reproductive biology, so I was taking out gonads out of hundreds of fish, which meant the stomachs right there. And of course, I look at the stomachs. I want to see, are, you know, are they? they? They say they don't eat in fresh water, but of course, I'm going to look at the stomachs. Hundreds of fish, 
never found anything in their stomachs. So what we've seen on the St. John's is, is pretty interesting. Um, and I've got a picture of one of the critters. That's the Eastern mosquito fish, the little guppies. And um, so in 2000, which, what's the photo credit for this? Because I stole this, from, I stole <laughs> I this from your computer and I forgot the photo. I, uh, I think that came from one of the wildlife officers. Somebody took an aerial photograph. This was the beginning of September after Tropical Storm Fay. The river got to record stage, actually flowed across State Road 46. That's the Jolly Gator Fish Camp off in the distance, sitting on a little island. And um, well, what happens when you have this much water on the floodplain? You know, if you get a flood, if you get a flood this big up north, it's up, it's back down, destroys everything. That flood gets up there and it sits for months. The river was out of its banks from September 1st or whenever. The Fay was in late August. The river was out of its banks like that until mid-December. So you've got you know, part of August, September, October, November, December. You've got four and a half months of the waters up in the marsh. So all those little marsh critters that are normally in the ditches and stuff, they just proliferate like crazy. And so, and actually like right now when the river's dropping, even if it's not shad, if you go to the river and fish when the river's going back within bank, all that stuff that's living in the marsh, because these little mosquito fish and those grass shrimp, they can reproduce every four weeks, new generation. So their populations just explode. And when the water goes back down, they all spill back into the river. And it's a major source of production for all fisheries in the St. John's River. It's what drives the bass fishing and the brim fishing and the crappie fishing. It's all that food. Well, it turns out that if the timing is right and the water is going back within banks at the same time that the shad show up and the river's just completely full of these little tiny fish, you actually find them in their stomachs. That's the stomach contents from a single shad. Um, so it's grass shrimp on top, mosquito fish on the bottom. Um, so I'll put a little example picture there. So when they're hitting, when the crappie fishermen are out there with their little crappie minnows and they're hitting their crappie minnows, you know, they're they're trying to eat, but it's still what happens is this food resource is fairly ephemeral. Um, this feeding occurred in January into the very beginning of February and then tapered off. And by the time April rolled around, all the shad were skin and bones. So, But when the shad are feeding like this, you can fish for them differently. Um, what happens is if you fish for shad, you know, sometimes you've got to kind of cast down current, kind of quartering, just kind of twitch it back right along the bottom and get that little tap, tap, tap bite. If you actually find them chasing bait, and you'll see it when it's happening, because you'll see the bait showering. And a lot of times this will be happening where you'll have the floodplain will have water on it, but only just a little bit, and it's just coming off, and all that bait's coming out of the marsh. And everything will be at that spot. There'll be bass, crappie, and so you'll be fishing for shad, and then you catch a, a total hodgepodge of fish, but you can fish differently because that's when you can put on a little streamer or a curly tail jig or even a small rattle trap and catch you know, a fast retrieve. If you're fly fishing, you can strip it really fast, and their behavior is <clears throat> different when this is going on. So it's, we've only seen this in one year. We've been monitoring shad now since 2002 and 2009 after phase the only time we actually documented that much in their stomachs I've seen them attempting to feed in other years when there's a lot of bait around but not never anything like that and so that's I guess that was a lot of material hopefully it's not overloaded <laughs> but uh Anybody has any questions or wants me to go or wants me to elaborate on anything? Can you tell me one more time. Okay. It's crazy enough to go there. Uh, 46 at Dirt Road, you say part of Dirt Road. Is it one mile, two mile, three miles? Hat What's the name of the road? Is it called Hatfield? Hatfield Hat 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 Park Bill. Road. Hatfield Park Road. Is it a legal public park to go back? Absolutely. It's, it's called Hatfield Park. It's yeah, a, there's a sign that says County Park. 
Yeah. Turn the big tell you restaurants on in Rockman Lodge. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Nobody's ever showed me how to do it. So the only way the only way I've cooked them that I've been able to eat them without driving myself crazy is fillet them, skin the fillet. And I, this recipe was off of the Washington state of Washington's Department of Natural Resources website because they're trying to get people to eat shad because they're so abundant in the Columbia River Basin. And you put it in a baking pan, fat side up, covered in a covered dish, and bake it at 225 for like four, five hours. That's what I've heard. The Indians used to do it that way. And you bake it really slow, 225, and then when it's everything's good and soft, you uncover it, kick the heat up to brown it, and it'll get crispy on the ends and on the top. And then it's... It's not bad. <laughs> it's not great. It's, the biologist that was on the Shad Project, he's he's now up at um, he's up at, he's up at Woods Hole doing stock assessments in the Northeast Atlantic. But when he was handling the Shad, his saying with Shad was, "Yeah, they used to eat Shad. Then they found grouper." <laughs> that, was, that was his saying. Scientific name for Shad. And if you can if you can really work at it, cut some bone free strips and then cook those normally. It's the flesh is sweet, it's very soft. But the flesh is, is it's got a good flavor. It's just and I think it makes a difference for the fish that are on the spawning grounds. You see how much weight they lose? Once they start losing weight, I think the flesh quality goes. Yeah, because you get that fattiness. You have to have a really robust like because when they're really when they first come in, they've got so much fat that when you cook them, they make their own grease. They'll be swimming in their own grease, you know. Um, and so I think the flesh quality really declines when they really start to lose weight. I think most eating shad would be caught early in the run, especially in the old days when they used to intercept the fish at the river mouth. Um, so I think that makes a difference. I prepared it one time. Six hours later, we ate a uh, chad dip, which was really tasty, but it was a pain in the butt. So I was hoping it was another. That's my experience too, the same way. I slow smoke it and then pick it through it. It was like, well, that didn't work too well, so I made the uh, dip fish dip. And it's edible, but um, they used to pickle them, I guess, back in the, in the early days in the, in the they, book, The Founding they, Fish. They uh, pickled them in brine, and actually, the, would, the Native Americans on the on the uh, Mattapani River that when I was doing my thesis work, I had to figure out how to collect fish on the spawning grounds, and those guys actually showed me how to fish and drift gill nets. And then they became my way of getting rid, because I'm just taking the gonads out, and I've got loads of carcasses, and they took them. They, had, they pickled them in brine, in barrels. Most and they, they eat them all year long. So this is really the catch it, there's a guy. There's a guy with the Jacksonville Fly Fishing Club who he's the he's the prophet of eating shad because whenever I've given talks up there, he just sings the praises of how good they are. They're the best fish he's ever eaten. Eaten, and I think he accounts for about fifty percent of the harvest of shad in the St. John's River. There's one guy that comes down from South Carolina and fishes for shad, and then there's a guy from Jacksonville that comes down. And if you happen to be at the boat ramp. They'll have they'll have shad in their cooler. Nobody nobody else brings them back, except for a couple guys that cut them up for catfish bait. When they were harvesting, what were they harvesting them for? Food. They were prim They were a food fish. They went into smoked meat, canned meat, and then the roe was the primary thing. Oh. And the roe is valuable. I mean, even now, with, I mean, the fishery is really limited. There's some commercial fishing on the Delaware stock, a little bit of fishing in Georgia and South Carolina. And the road sells. My brother lives up in the mountains of North Carolina, and if he decides he wants to fry some shad row, he has to pay twenty twenty five dollars for one set, just one little one one pair of ovaries out of a female shad. Is it similar to mullet? It's fairly similar. Yeah, it's. I mean, I've I've had it. Most of the time, it's, it's super good. Every now and again, I get a piece that's not quite right, and I think it's because the fish has been in the river a little too long. 
or maybe I didn't do a good job cleaning it and maybe got some intestine on it or something. But um, the vent when they're when they're on the spawning grounds, if you flip them over, the, the female vent is larger than the males, and plus the males, if you give them a little squeeze, they'll. Let them go. Um, Females, actually, if you ever look at the row, most of the time it's just kind of yellowy or orange, but there's a lot of eggs of different sizes in there. But then sometimes it's speckled with translucent eggs, and those are the eggs that are going to be spawned that day because that, those eggs have gone through the final process of maturing. Um, so, But you notice the females aren't like that every day, or every female you catch is if you look at them. The females spawn once every two to three days. Once they drop a batch, it takes them a couple of days to get the next batch ready. But the males are always prowling around and ready for the next female that, that, that comes in. So that's why you'll see one female, she goes across the sandbar, she'll have five or six males pursuing her. It's because they're just always going. So that's pretty easy to tell them apart when you catch them because of that. They're slightly smaller. They tend to be smaller and, and especially thinner through the belly because their their reproductive organs aren't big. So every once in a while you get a really robust male. You're like, yeah, that might be a female, but typically they're just thinner. Oh, the hickory shad. Actually, you could pro you might be able to go out there right now and catch a hickory shad. Uh, they tend to run a lot earlier than American shad. And part of that is the hickory shad don't make the huge coastal migration. They tend to go out in the near shore ocean. And probably our hickory shad stay south of Cape Hatteras. Some of them may even stay like down in the lower estuary. Um, but the hickory shad looks sort of, they look a lot like American shad. A lot of people just can't tell them apart. Um, they're more aggressive fish eaters. They're actually piscivorous by nature. They eat anchovies and things like that. Um, so if you catch a shad that has kind of a, and their, their lower jaw sticks out. So one, if the hickory shad are around and you're fishing a minnow-like lure, he's going to be even more likely to strike than an American shad, just because they, they really naturally eat fish. Um, and if you ever look inside the mouth of the shad and you see the gill rakers, you know, the little filaments that stick off the gills, and on an American shad, it looks like a, a really fine-toothed comb. And the hickory shad, they're short and stubby. Like, not not like like a bass, but they're... Because they don't need to filter plankton. Um, and you will catch both side by side. Especially if you fish down there in the Cameron White area, um, closer to Lake Jessup, Lake Monroe. That's kind of the center of where the hickory shad spawn. There's a popular fishing area, it's the S-curve by Mullet Lake Park. There's a always a hickory shad aggregation right there. And nine fishermen out of ten that fish there, if they come in and talk to my Creole clerk, they call it American shad. Or they think the hickory shad are buck shad. So they look really similar, but the hickory shad has an undershot jaw, tend to be a little bit smaller, um, a little more olive colored really deeply forked tail, even more so than the American Shad, but those differences are really subtle. You need to look at them side by side. Maybe I need to put some pictures in. Species. I was, uh, right below the Susquehanna Dam over there, one of the big bucktail. I don't know, I was fishing for it, which is a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And on every cast, a hickory shad impaled his tail on it. Yeah. Now what might it? Or they were slapping it and then it would be eating. Huh. I've, I've caught hickory shad. Um, I used to live on the, the mouth of the York River, and I'd go out and fish the dock lights for stripers in April and May uh, when the stripers are coming back down after the spawn. And uh, I was fishing four inch pink tailed Mr. Twister, and something kept hitting it, but I couldn't hook him. And so I switched to the little tandem spec rig. Started hit, and it was hickory shad. 
and they were feeding on anchovies. It was it was bay anchovies that the stripers were hitting underneath the lights, and I was kind of like, yeah, bass side by side on a or the hickory shad were trying to take that four inch mm -hmm. grub, but they couldn't. They couldn't get it, and when I switched to a smaller lure, I started catching one every cast. And those were post-spawn fish, you know, that, had, that were coming back down. Um, so, hickory shad are pretty aggressive, and if they're around, you're definitely gonna you'll catch catch those if you, if they're around. But they're sometimes they're not the easiest to tell apart. I mean, once you've seen them side by side a lot, they're easy to tell apart. But a lot of people, when they catch those little hickory shad and they've got the undershot shot jaw, they assume that's a male American shad and throw it back in the river. Does anybody have any 